Welcome to the show, I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. And today we are discussing Get Out. Get the <laughs> f*** out. Get out of here. But James came back, finally. Get in. We'll laugh, we'll argue. We might get a little too into it, but at the end of the day, they're just movies. Spoiler alert. <laughs> We're the show that a recent five-star review called the best movie podcast in town. What town, you might ask? We don't know either. Movie town. Po- podcast town. But next week, we're going to do Jordan Peele's Nope. That's right. And this week, we're doing Jordan Peele's Get Out. Now, I don't think we've ever done a double feature like this, like two weeks in a row, same director. There's no. But you know what? It's our podcast. There's no rules. Do we can do what we want to. Although we have done, like, Star Wars, which is the same. We did some of the prequels. Not two in a row. Lord Maybe of the Rings was weeks. three. Well, not in a row. You're no, right. Never yeah, in a row. We always spice row. it up. But you know what? Who doesn't like Get Out? Yeah. And then it's a great nope, nope's the new movie. Wait, so. that's spoilers. That's spoilers for our takes. Let's hear those takes. <laughs> David, give us your rating out of 10. Get Out first entertained me into a temper of acquiescence, then masterfully magnified those real life microaggressions. <laughs> and let's be honest, probably macro ones too. I didn't acknowledge I was propagating into a horror so frighteningly potent. I've carried the thought of it ever since. What the heck? You lost me at acquiescence. I had no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Give me numbers. 9.3 to 10. Hell okay. yeah. This movie's fucking awesome. There we go. Basically, I, it entertains you until you're ready to accept that you're a fucking racist. Whoa. And uh, and then Let's, you accept it and you're like, I got to change. I that You know, honestly, that wasn't my experience. Well, that's because you're an perfect. angel baby. That's because I'm so good. Uh, but, I mean, I see what you're saying. It's, it's great. Should I give mine? Yes, please. As a white person who is very into, quote, sex slaves and shit, this movie really made me feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, Get Out is one of the rare movies that can expertly combine genuine horror, comedy, and provocative social commentary, and it's one of my favorite films ever. Nine out of ten. I mean, it's Give it great. Give it a number five. Give it a number five. Come on. If it's one of your favorites of all time. You're going to get canceled if you don't I increase like this. I, I I think I just, I gave it a nine <laughs> being like, yeah, you know what? That's a solid nine. I don't generally go into the decimal spaces yeah. above a nine unless I was like crying my eyes out or something. Oh uh, yeah. You didn't this cry is more of a one. thinker, which is good, mm-hmm. but I feel like if it had more of an emotional component where I was like, like an oh, anime scene. he escaped, you know, then I'd be like, then it would be higher. It's I mean, something. catharsis is an emotion, isn't it? You know, what's interesting is it I doesn't did. have to be like, it can be a movie that you wouldn't change a thing. But it's still not a 10. Right. Yeah. That's exactly. Fair. Exactly. I don't think I would want them to put that in there. I'm just saying that's that's my 10. A genre blending original horror screenplay from a famous comedian that provides one half the audience, people of color, with representation they never really had before. And the other half, white people, with a healthy helping of introspection. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> no Asian or Indian people saw this movie. I said people of color. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> that's, that's everyone. I you said black people. Uh, 9.25 out of 10. It's an awesome movie. It rules. And it's a good watch, too. I think if you described it to someone, I could see how it would be an overbearing movie. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's like a movie about its message. But it's a fun-ass movie to watch. Yeah, yeah, and it's a great rewatch. Yeah, yeah there's so much in there. I was going to, I was, I almost made my slogan something about how the first watch for a white person is sort of uncomfortable because you're like wait are we the baddies uh and but on the second watches it's like even if you felt that way in the first watch like you you can't help but appreciate just how expertly everything is i really want to talk about the yeah how you feel the first time versus how you feel the second Mm -hmm. time aspect of this movie is it really is masterfully done right after this message from our sponsors manscaped's number one for sponsoring today's episode. They're the best. Uh, Manscaped's Lawnmower 4.0 is designed to keep your family jewels, that's your genitals, safe with their ceramic blades featuring skin safe tech to reduce nicks and cuts. Leave the cables at home with its new wireless charging system that's compatible with most Qi charging pads. It's cordless, waterproof, and gets 90 minutes of use on a full charge. Head to manscaped.com slash TJM20 and get 20% off and free shipping today. Thanks to Secret Lab for sponsoring this video. Secret Lab chairs are designed to keep you comfortable for those long nights of work and play. Working at night from home? That's crazy. (laughs) Their Titan Evo 2022 chairs offer four-way lumbar support. That's part of your back. Comes with a magnetic (laughs) memory foam head pillow and is offered in different upholsteries like hybrid leatherette, soft weave fabric, and Napa leather, the official leather of white people. (laughs) Best of all, all, a five-year extended warranty is included along with a 49-day return policy. On day 50, Watch out. Uh, you're covered if anything goes wrong. 49 days. Why 49? How about 69, Secret Lab? 
That would be nice. <laughs> Learn more about Secret Lab at lmg.gg slash Secret Lab TJM. I love that. I liked, I liked all the asides there. That was fun. <laughs> Thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring today's show. Ever needed a quick clip for a video but didn't have the capacity to make it yourself? Storyblocks helps you bring your stories to life without sacrifice due to time, budget, or resources. There are over a million royalty-free assets for you to choose from, including 4K HD footage, Adobe templates, music, images, and a wide array of diverse and inclusive content. But you know, are there really white people's brains inside those faces? We don't know. From their unlimited all-access plan that gives you unlimited video and audio downloads <laughs> to enterprise licensing so your entire company has access to assets as you need them. We use Storyblocks on Linus Tech Tips as we don't always have time to go out and shoot the perfect B-roll footage. So take your videos to the next level by checking out Storyblocks today at storyblocks.com slash TJM. It's in the game. It's in the game, buddy. I guess uh, we should take a moment to acknowledge we're all white people here, so yeah. we're giving the white viewer perspective on this film. Bit annoying, I actually w went on YouTube and said and t typed in black people react to get out, and there was like one. What? Huh. Yeah, is that weird? There's a bunch of people like watching the first half hour or hour of the movie. I mean, now you're, just, now you're just making me think about whether people would make a video with the title black people react or whether they would just make a video like i, I to react it. well i saw all of them i saw the search results and they were mostly white people if they if those videos existed at all you searched black people react and you got mostly videos of white people. well you're gonna get people of re like react <laughs> to get out right sorry you're just saying because that was what was available <laughs> or the youtube algorithm is racist and it pushed it pushed it's it possible. down it's possible. that's crazy could be the Jews. You didn't go all the way to the Jesus. bottom of the internet. This is all right. This is already a spicy podcast. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> Let's uh, start with synopsis. Yeah, sure. Award-winning photographer Chris Washington is headed to the country with his girlfriend Rose to meet the parents. But knowing that he's her first black boyfriend, he's a bit nervous about what the weekend holds. Once he arrives, he's met with the typical awkwardness of white people overperforming the acceptance of his blackness, but something else far more unsettling is going on. The two black servants, Walter and Georgina, are acting eerie, unlike any black person Chris has ever encountered. That night, Rose's mom, Missy, hypnotizes Chris to quit smoking, temporarily making him experience a sunken form of self-spectatorship called the sunken place. At the annual Armita Armitage? Armitage? Uh, Armitage. Party, Chris is attacked by Logan, the only other black man at the party, who is also acting bizarre. While Chris and Rose contemplate leaving, we see a sort of slave auction going on with the guests bidding for Chris. With the help of his best friend Rod, Chris discerns that Logan is actually a distant acquaintance of his who's been missing for six months. Now knowing that something truly fucked is going on, Chris tries to leave, but Rose turns on him and helps her family trap Chris in the basement, where they inform him that he's the next subject of the coagula procedure, in which white minds are transplanted into black bodies, thus putting Chris's mind into the sunken place forever. Chris is able to escape from his captivity and kill the Armitage family. Just as he's about to leave, a cop car rolls up and the optics of the situation make things look grim. But thankfully, it's Rod who comes out of the car and returns Chris to safety. Fuck yeah, TSA! <laughs> motherfucking Handle this. TS motherfucking A. <laughs> Let's talk about the beginning of this movie. Okay. The opening. That yes. first shot. It's a solid first scene. I like the the way that it's shot where it's just like it places you in the scene you're kind of falling around you're made uncomfortable but i like thematically that it's kind of a reversal yes of like this kind of racist trope of like the black guy walking around the nice white neighborhood but really he's the one under in threat. danger he's the yeah. one in danger gets kidnapped then bam we're in the movie yeah it was kind of funny because i think we've had a lot of horror movies where an external threat comes into a suburb and then it's like you know oh this nice pristine suburb is being disturbed by this external threat but we I, I think the innovation of this movie was to make the suburb itself the threat. Yeah. You like, know what? And, and to that point, actually, I was reading the screenplay and the, this first scene is actually quite different in the screenplay. Uh, it has this added element of a scene happening in one of the suburban houses with mm. a white family. Oh. And they're just talking about they're having dinner. The dad's like scrolling on his tablet. They're like talking about an upcoming trip to Disneyland. Mm. And then the uh, guy outside that's Lakeith Stanfield's character, yeah, right? Yeah. He like stops. He's trying to figure out where he's going. He stops on the lawn and then the, the lawn is flooded with the light of one of those oh, exterior yeah, yeah. automatic lights. Oh. And then the dad inside like looks up and then the dude walks away. So, you know, so there's like, oh, we're be we are being disturbed mm -hmm. by this, uh, this d dark shadowy figure outside. Yeah. Um, but then, then the car rolls up 
and then it's actually way longer and stuff. They simplified it for the final movie, right. which I think was the right choice. I think it's better to have that that first scene be tight, which it which it was. Um, but but they finished that scene by going back into the house. Oh, and uh, the, the the one kid has been talking about how. Disneyland's been spoiled by this other boy at school saying, hey, this kid said that there's like multiple Mickeys. And like this kid said that the like Mickey's face doesn't move when he talks and all this. And the d- dad keeps like dispelling them so that it's still going to be fun. And then the final thing he says is about uh, something like. I forget what the kid asked, but the dad's answer is it's because Mickey's face hasn't changed in 100 years. And that's kind mm. of similar to like what's going on, like staying young forever. It's like kind yeah. of like a note oh. that nods at the rest of the movie. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, yeah, it wasn't that it's strong kind of, anyway. Yeah, so. it's kind of interesting. I understand why they cut it, but yeah, there's something co- cool there. I think that um, for me on my first watch through, I think the one of the the like not only does it make the suburb the 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 place that is like the the source of the threat, but it's also like a reversal of. Like black people and white people watching this movie have very different impressions, especially the first time through, because we see someone walking in a suburb and white people, especially people who come from, you know, sort of suburban middle class areas like this, we're like, this isn't a dangerous moment, you know, but it's like, we don't feel danger. We we don't feel in danger because white people <laughs> is are the horror monster in this movie. Well, he's still... Signaling to all audiences, though, like everyone can relate because he's saying, I'm, I'm sticking out like a sore thumb and, and I'm lost. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so it is bringing everybody in. Right. And obviously the guy pulling up in the car and like coming out and getting like, that's all dangerous. That's like standard horror movie stuff. But I think in just in terms of the setting, it's it's I love the reversal of of making white people feel as if the place where you are comfortable this is how, what that makes black people feel. Yeah, like. and you're gaining perspective yeah. that well, way. Even, I mean, we can jump a little bit to the end <clears throat> for a second. How they reverse and make Chris the monster, in a sense, where like he's the one killing everybody. Right. And so like in the sense of a horror movie, that's kind of like the, the climax is usually the monster going around killing the family one by one. But he's the hero. Yeah. And he's fighting his way out. But even just the fact that they reverse that and kind of change the perspective of which how we're experiencing it. And I'm like, oh, that's smart. The whole movie right. is all about flipping the script and our expectations on, yeah, the, on its head. You can mentally like view it through this lens or this lens. Like he's either the hero killing all the bad guys or we have all the white people in their home being murdered by a black yeah. man. Well, that well, does happen in <laughs> in non-racial horror movies sometimes. Like if it's a monster in the house kind of story pattern and you got to like escape the house. Like in the Hills Have Eyes remake from 2006, um, that dude who survives through it spoilers is he does kill a lot of the like okay. demented family members that's fair on that's his way fair. out mm. okay i was a little bit wrong yeah it's just different ways to it, it yeah. works both ways different lenses. Yeah. yeah i uh i think they do such a good about the beginning also setting the 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 way the relationship is with rose and chris yeah uh, that, that intercut there's i love the intercut when she's staring at the donuts and then it, it's like these frosted donuts or whatever. And then it cuts to him in his bathroom and he's putting shaving cream on like he's <laughs> frosting himself. She's uh-huh. shaving it. Yeah. And she's got this like intense stare. Like she's like hungry for these donuts. Yeah. And then Her cuts. face is weird. Like yeah. even at that part, you're like, if it, once you know this, the twist of the movie and you rewatch, you're like, so many of the faces she makes are kind of benign at first. But then if you look at them with this knowledge, you're like, yeah, yeah she's being creepy. All yeah, she kind of has that face. I don't know. I mean, did you guys watch Girls the show? Yeah. No. Marnie. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I feel like I feel like that show has a vibe where it, on the surface it just seems like oh, it's like Friends. You know, it's just like a, a group of it's Friends. Group. If you hated every character, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friends and like kind of mixed with Seinfeld, where like mm. you have to, you are supposed to realize that these people are horrible. And I feel like Allison Williams. I don't know what it is about her, but it's just like. Maybe it's just that she just looks, she has that like, uh, I don't know, default stock white person look where you're just kind of like. Evil Barbie. Maybe you're a little bit evil. Yeah. yeah. But before we get into that scene, I still want to hang a little bit on the opening. Yeah. Um, first, we've, we've mentioned Get Out multiple times in this podcast for deploying this mechanic where if you want to have a long act one where not a lot happens, just put a scene at the beginning that tells the audience what's coming. So yeah. it, it, this is a horror movie, right? If we start with the rom-com in their apartment going <laughs> to the parents' house, you have to wait so long before like the thriller aspect comes in. Yeah, right. So you don't start with that. You start with, let's just have like an attack or murder mm. right at the beginning. Right. So people know what's coming. And then they can relax for 25 minutes where we put everything in place. 
and then we'll ramp up the horror again later. Right. I, I heard someone say recently that horror is great because you know that the danger is there and you know that it's going to come up at some point. And so that's where the tension comes from. Yep. And then the next thing I want to talk about was the opening credits, how it's kind of weird because it's split. Like the opening credits, they go from that scene where the dude gets attacked and it says, get out. And you hear this creepy music with these like forestry scenes. Mm. And that's only half of the opening credits. And then it cuts to now we're inside the apartment with with the um, R&B music playing. It's a uh, Childish Gamb- Gambino. Yeah. And that's like the second half of opening credits. It's just weird to kind of like just cut them in half like that. Mm. I guess you wanted you're, you have to do a huge tone shift from this. You just saw a guy get murked. And now we're going to go into the safety of this apartment. Yeah. And, and how did we get there? I guess they decided let's just do a hard cut. I don't know. I, mid, I like mid it. opening credits. I yeah. feel like it, uh, you know, in in the same way that the murder scene sort of tone sets the fact that like this is not going to be you know a rom com, so don't settle in too much. Uh, I feel like that hard cuts like that kind of introduce us to Jordan Peele's style, where it's sort of like a, it's a mix between horror and comedy, where you know uh, we can have these sort of like. Oh, we're we're feeling so tense and something horrible is happening, and then we cut to Rod and he's like talking about fucking uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's like <laughs> oh, yeah, blowjobs yeah, with their heads yeah. getting cut off and stuff. Like, so I feel like that kind of like hard cutting to stuff. It's 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 a hallmark of comedy, and so I think seeing it in this kind of like yeah. sets the tone. Well, there. even during that montage when he calls and he says he get he got in trouble for like searching the old lady because there's kind of like an implicit bias like oh we can judge people by how they look this old lady's a sweet innocent old lady we shouldn't shouldn't judge her and we shouldn't frisk her we shouldn't search her because that's just like the societal norm we're already introducing that theme of like we just accept that this is how things are and like that's normal we it's fine to judge people yeah it's great thematically and it's, but it's also characterizing rod cuz it's showing he's he's like that this paranoid person who's taking nothing for granted he's making no assumptions <laughs> yeah why would i not extend the same logic to this other person yes yeah well, and, and and assuming that an elderly white bitch could not <laughs> hijack a plane maybe she could maybe she if could. she's part of the armitage family it's true <laughs> i think rod's my favorite character he's the best he's, so he's the in the in the uh monster in the house kind of story pattern which this fits uh he's what they call the half man we talked about this many times it comes from jaws the guy who's like literally bitten the, the person who's faced the monster before mm-hmm. he hasn't but he's he's the person in this movie that's kind of t- warning chris right. the whole time yeah these red flags are around you you need to recognize them yeah. and get out. Maybe he hasn't encountered, you know, uh, uh, body body swapping uh, white cult people before, but he has like encountered a lot of probably dangerous stuff in uh, in his job. In the he, very he's read about it before. Yeah, <laughs> going through detect- the same school as the detectives, and you know, uh, he's hilarious. I love Rod in this movie. I mean, <laughs> when he's talking about uh, like uh, Chris is on the phone with him, and he's like, "Yeah, Dre, uh, who's Logan? Uh, wait." Lakeith, Lakeith Sanfeld. That's so funny. In the subtitles, they they call him like the subtitles refers to Logan as Dre. Who's Logan? Logan is Lakeith Sanfield. I think he's Andre. He's Andre. Andre. Maybe it's Andre Logan. Is his last name Logan? Yeah, or something. Anyways, he's saying Logan was just some lady thirty years older than him, and Rod's yeah, like, Andre sex slave. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some eyes wide shut situation. Leave, motherfucker. Eyes wide shut. <laughs> yeah. Kubrick's last movie. Just There's like, actually a Kubrick Easter egg in this movie. Oh, is there? Yeah, it's a, and it's a Rod scene too. It's when Rod's at the airport and he's, he's talking on the phone, and you can hear in the background it's like flight two three seven. Oh, Obama. I missed that. Mm. Hit pick. Two three seven is the hotel room in The Shining. Yeah, his name is Andrew Andre Logan King. Right. Yeah. So I feel like uh, I don't have a specific note for this, but I know we have to talk about kind of the idea that this movie doesn't like it. It it obviously addresses racism, but it's I think the I don't know if it was an innovation or you know obviously there had movies been movies that talk about like you know the effects of systemic racism and stuff in the past, but I think that what, something that this movie did so well is to point out that you can this this sort of racism, not overt like KKK racism. But uh, a racism light can exist in just these like well-meaning middle class or not upper middle class, upper class yeah. uh, white liberals. Yeah. So in Jordan Peele's own <clears throat> words, uh, he basically said it's like it's this thing that people do when they're trying to make a connection with an other, mm. you know, they're try- but that it ends up othering them. You know, you have yeah. good, you have good intentions and you're saying stuff like, you know, I would vote for Obama or yeah. like, I really also like 
basketball or something like that you're trying to make a connection yeah. but what you're really doing is like i'm noticing your blackness yeah and let's let's you're just talk about the difference like yeah the fact that he refers to him as my man yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, um, so bradley whitford the the dad yeah. uh he just does such a good job because i like i see i saw my dad in this 100%. and i wouldn't say that i've like witnessed my dad in this like, exact same situation where I'm like w- like f- watching him interact with someone else and they're uncomfortable. But like just the sort of mannerisms of like trying too hard to connect with people, trying too hard to be funny. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, it's so cringe and awkward because it works on us as white people because yeah. we're like, we know people who do that. Maybe we've done it ourselves in times. Yeah, even the one where the, I think the Japanese guy, he's like, in your opinion... Is it like do the benefits outweigh the cons, or what has oh, the black yeah, experience yeah, yeah. been like for you? And that's a really interesting one because it's, it's an example of the first watch versus the rewatch. On the first watch, you think he's just is like, yeah, he's doing that thing where he's, you know, just asking it. He's really asking about what's your experience been like. You really th- that is a question that's like, hey, I'm trying to connect with you deeply. Yeah. I want to know what your experience has been like. It's you don't have to have bad intentions or be racist to ask yeah. a question like that. I mean, that. that's funny that you worded like that because you were like. What is your what is the black experience been like for you? That's what you said, and I was like, if he said that, that would be much better. Yeah. But he said, has it been easier or harder for you as a black yeah. man? Or that's something? because of the reverse, which is on the rewatch. You understand, <clears throat> he's asking because he's like, if I'm to become black, yeah, yeah by yeah. spending millions of dollars on uh, a body, will it be cool? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the rewatch. So I think this is my third or fourth time watching this movie. Wow, and I that's know that's a lot for you. I know. This should, I, I love it. Out. I love the movie. It's so good. Um, but uh, it makes it like it was almost harder to watch because I was like, I kept noticing these things that I was like, oh, he's asking it because that. Because the first time you're through, you're watching it through, you don't really know what's going on. You're yeah. like, okay, there's a vibe here. There's kind of like a weird sort of racist but not really vibe. Yeah. And on the on the sub- subsequent watches, you're like. Okay, I know exactly what's going on. And oh, he said that because of that. And yeah. oh, I noticed yeah. that thing in the my background favorite, because that means my, that this. My favorite example of that. This is only my second time watching it, but it's when uh, Jake Peralta's dad's walking him through the house. Jake and Peralta's he's, dad. He shows him like the, the portrait of his grandpa sprinting. Is he Jake Peralta's dad in Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah. Okay, that's so um, And he's like, oh yeah, he was a, a sprinter. You know, he got beat by this yeah. guy. He, like, he thought he could have, but like didn't. And it's like kind of like, again, othering him because he's like, just because he's black, you know, he was better. It's, it's okay. But then that's why the grandpa is sprinting at him is because he's still got that brain of like, I want to be a sprinter. Yeah, he's oh, so and fast. And he's got this black body. He's like, I want to be fast because I'm black. Yeah. And I was like, and the first time I was just like, oh, it's just a weird like brain thing that's happening because he's like not possessed, but right. whatever. But this time it's like, oh, it's foreshadowing that that is the grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a, uh, there was a deleted not or like a cut line that Peel said uh, that originally at the end when that character sprints at him and takes him down, like at the climax where everyone's dying, he was gonna pin him down and be like, ah, I got you now, I finally beat your time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, um, your time? It, it doesn't make sense because he's yeah, limping it, and stuff. Yeah, it was too on the nose and stuff, so yeah. they, they got rid of it. But Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that uh, that scene is so great where they're looking at the photo because he's like, oh, Hitler comes up here with this like race essentialist stuff. Like they think black people are physically, or superior, or they think, they think the Aryan race is physically superior. And then mm. this black guy shows up and it's so great because it's like, it seems as if he's saying, yeah, ha, got you. Like you race essentialism is wrong, but they are race essentialists. Yeah. They're just the they, other way. They think side. that black people are f- stronger and faster b- by nature. Well, that's one of the things I found really challenging was in my growing up. Uh, that's something that I carried like to kind of combat being racist. I was like, almost like over glorifying like my black friends yeah you know? and like you're like oh man i wish i could do this i wish i could say like be like this but it's like <laughs> it's you're participating in a weird way by overcompensating this is right. when caleb way. goes with your frame and genetic yeah. makeup you could be a beast yeah totally. so and I think, uh, uncomfortable yeah oh god but jeremy is the worst he's well, the no, worst. he's he's not even the worst he's just the most aggressive right and it's cool that the, each family member sort of represents a different angle on like how white suburban people are racist in their own fucked yeah. up way. I mean, so like, this is why, so when you brought up that you're like, oh, it made me think about all these microaggressions and all that stuff. I think that, like, I don't doubt that I have done things uh, that, you know, maybe came across as weird or something in certain si- situations, but I don't think that I ever 
Like I feel I, maybe maybe maybe, maybe this is just because my memory sucks ass. It's really bad. But I feel like I've always kind of had this sort of like, okay, colorblind is not nope. good. But I've had the I've I, I haven't like tried to place emphasis on someone's race or anything at yeah. any time, which I think that like, I mean, I think this is an interesting conversation because obviously I think what everyone wants is a colorblind society eventually where we don't have to acknowledge uh, realities of people being discriminated against historically or currently because it's not happening. Like we want that we want that not to happen so that we can have a colorblind society. I think it's and the the argument is that the argument is that okay, we can't be colorblind because people are being discriminated against and there is this systemic thing and historical oppression mm -hmm. and so we have to recognize that you can't just pretend that a black person is the same as a white person because their experiences in society are different. So you so I think that's where it comes from, right? Yeah. You want to acknowledge that hey, you know, like you were saying asking what has the black experience been like for you, you know, like giving them the floor you you tell us what's going on but uh it, it's tough because we want this colorblind thing right I, I think a lot of the a lot of the stuff we're talking that they're showing in this movie where they're you know just pointing out these they're, they're trying to connect in these various ways but i think it really comes down to just inexperience like mm. you obviously mm. just haven't spent that much time around black people and yeah, so exactly. that's why you're reaching for those things exactly whereas if you just worked in a place where like half of them are black or lived in a city with, with a ton of black people and just had many many black friends it would just be a non yeah a non not even an issue just like a non thing you right just, wouldn't yeah. see it yeah if you actually like lived in and amongst you know people a, a, a diverse community or whatever you wouldn't be thinking like oh they're the other they're just other people yeah um <clears throat> which i think also speaks to how like truly psychopathic rose's character is that <sighs> she can you know be with black people for so long, she dates so many of them, listen to them, talk to them, and the whole time she just like, is not changed. She's just like, you are still Well, that's the one objects. aspect of this movie that they never say out loud because <laughs> Chris says, why, why black people? Why right. us? Why right. black people? And they never say, because it's easier to justify mentally. It's mm. easier to, to put them in a category just like the, the uh, Nazis did with Jews, to yeah. dehumanize you. Mm. It's interesting because in one on one hand they well they view them as animals basically. They're like you are stronger and faster, but the that's the strength of black people. The dad the says that at one part. He says like with he says like yeah, like we're we're mirroring your strength and and our ambition. Well, that's or, what well, there's yeah, there's like that the grandpa Keen in Peel, the video. Yeah, the grandpa. There's that Keen yeah. Peel sketch that's so funny where it's like football announcers and they're talking about these different players and when it's like a white player they're like he's like you know like a, a great ba quarterback he's a tactician he's a he's an intelligent player and then when it's like the black people like he's a beast he's an animal <laughs> yeah. uh, and i think like that's one of the levels of racism in this movie where it's right. like the, the white people covet their skills or their abilities but think that they could do a better job because their brains are better it's right, like scary right. spice she wears animal print Right. Oh God, that's <laughs> fucked up. I never thought about yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. They're, they're always like exotic, exoticized. Right. That's, that's true. So yeah. Funny. Yeah. The exotic, exotic. How do you say it? I don't know. Exoticization. I, I just tried it. Sure. I liked it. Why not? Um, yeah. But like, that's. Uh, do you feel that tension there, though? It's 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 hard because we here we have Jordan Peele making this movie. That, I mean, this is a question I have while watching this movie. Does the movie believe? that black people are stronger and faster or because I, I would say that that can't be true. I don't think the movie does. I think it, it the movie is saying that white people fetishize the skills right. and abilities of black. Right. People. But then we see, you know, we see, uh, the grandpa like running and he's like enjoying his body or whatever. But I mean, I would just say that like, okay, it's a young body, you know, yeah. he's, he's, he's enjoying running fast. Yeah. Well, I think that's the strength of the movie is that it doesn't spell out absolutely everything. There, there is enough room that you can kind of, occupy it with yeah. your own interpretation right uh, and i think that works really well because the more you watch it the more you think and you're like oh yeah it's really fucked up in like a million different ways oh, i really like uh, going back to the first watch second watch thing is the whole smoking aspect of it right because on the first watch you're like oh man he's gonna go meet her parents will they accept him and then oh they're they really have a problem with him smoking i guess because they're like upper class health conscious people yeah. or something uh they're they're really 
they're really stuck on this point about the smoking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's be, but actually, it's because it's like, damn, are we gonna be able to sell this body? Right. Yeah. They need the body healthy. Yeah. This is so weird, and that's why <laughs> she, uh, Al, um, Rose, throws his cigarette out of the car on the way there as well. Oh. She yeah. just like throws it out, and he's like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah. She's like, nope, can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> also, don't smoke in cars. That's rude. <laughs> yeah. I'd be so mad if someone tried to light. A I mean, he should car. quit smoking. Not for those, not for yeah. the same reasons, but I love that. Yeah, it's the the way that the movie, like you said, first watch, second watch, and it's just a way to exert control over him. And that scene where she first hypnotizes him, it's so interesting that in order to be able to control him, she has to uh, take power over his trauma. Mm. She has to use his trauma in order to manipulate him to do what right. he wants. And I Make think that's an interesting. Guilty. That's an interesting angle of it. Is like. That's how we exert control is we we weaponize trauma against people. Right. Uh, and certainly like the black community has had their w- trauma weaponized against them. It's yeah. a smart way to do it because we also need to characterize Chris to care more about him. And mm-hmm. they have this whole theme throughout the movie of the deer and his mother mm-hmm. and everything. Um, because he doesn't really have much of an arc or he, he a lot of movies he wouldn't have any arc. It's just like we've got this cool premise. We need him to. It's a monster in the house. Yeah. But he does have this arc, and it's a really, really simple one, which is just be more proactive. Because mm. we've talked before about the three levers you can pull on for a character. They can either become more proactive, they can become more competent, or they can become more likable. He's already going to be likable. Uh, competency doesn't really play into this movie. It's really about being proactive. Get out. The whole yeah. movie, it's like his friend is telling him, don't go there. <laughs> don't meet her parents. Get out of here. And th- and he never does. He has to become proactive enough to actually get out. And then that is completely dovetailed with his p- personal history with his mom. He didn't get off his ass or get out of the house to go and help her. And he feels guilty for that. Yeah. Right. He need to, with his mother, he needed to become more proactive. So mm. that is just like so tight. Oh, yeah. But it's also, it's also that, super yeah. simple. Yeah. I didn't think about the title of the movie also referring to like get out of the house, you know, go like, yeah, don't sit there. I love the deer, uh, the connection between him and the deer. The fact that it's like set up right in, in that scene where they hit the deer. And, and he, how like, does mom die? Car accident. Right. Hit and run. Yeah. And, uh, and he walks up to the deer and just kind of like looks it in the eyes. And we have that like moment where the audience is just, you know, it's a little like on the nose, it's a but I, nose. but I, but I appreciate it because it, it pays off well. But we don't, they it's use not it. so on the nose be- on the first watch at least. Cause you don't know. It, Why is he staring at this deer that's dying? I think the well, the the problem I have with that scene, and that might be like my, my one problem in the movie, is that that's that's such a trope is like killing an innocent animal as a symbol or like a, a element of foreshadowing to like danger ahead. And I think that like in a movie that's so uh, I think sophisticated, it's like a really simple element that I think is just a little bit below. I think what they the elevated it though, because what you're saying, yes, and it is used to that effect. It's like let's have a scene that just is kind of weird and unnerving and just to like up the nervousness uh, yeah. of the audience in the seat. Uh, but it also, because they tie it into the theme with his mom, I think it's a That's little fair. elevated. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That's I, think, I, think, I think you're right about, yeah, about the trope in the beginning, but we also don't see it die. But then when they're explaining that they hit this deer to the parents, the dad asks, uh, you know, they did it die. And then Chris goes, yeah. Yeah. And so, that happened off screen, I guess. So yeah. he watched it die. And, it, and the fact that's one of the first things that Chris actually like says this to the yeah. parents, too. Well, I, I, what I love about that scene, too, is when they're talking to the cop, the cop is racist. And like that's something we've seen in movies. What I love is that it's Rose that gets upset. And I think that's, an, again, another angle of like the racism is like she's taking ownership of his experience yeah. and is like getting upset on his behalf. And he's like, I don't need that. We just need to do this. Get out of here. Yeah. And I think that's like something that a lot of white people do is they, they get angry on behalf of black people. And like, right. As but a I way think, of virtue signaling. But I she's think also, that, she's an, doing it to not leave a paper trail. Yeah, that's another mm, aspect to that that I didn't fair, think about until fair. later as well. She's like, I, we, I don't want the cop to see his ID and then be like, oh, I saw But I think him. it works in two ways because I think yeah. in the movie, yes, it's a, it makes logical sense that she's freaking out. But I think thematically wise, it right. also blows out outside of the movie. I agree but with I feel that. Like, I feel like that's not, I feel like that's an example where the movie is trying to endear her to us still at that point. Yes. Because, uh, I mean, I, f- I feel like you're right that that's like a, a a problematic thing that white people do sometimes where they're just like, no, I'm going to come here and like, you know, pro- I'm protecting black people or whatever. But I think in that, in that moment, it, it she, I think it's meant to be appreciated. Being, she's being really? anti-racist. Yeah. She's oh, being I, anti-racist. I think it's meant point. to be appreciated. I think the opposite. I feel like, I don't think that's an example. Like, and maybe you could interpret it as a way of maybe Chris, it's a signal that Chris is not proactive enough. Like maybe he should have stood up for himself. But I also like, I watch that and I'm like, 
lady, shut the fuck up. Just like let him re- like look at the ID. Don't make a big deal and just like move on. And like that sucks. But to me, I was like, chill, chill. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, see how, what is it going to accomplish? Without a black person here, I feel like we can't really say. Uh, but she's uh, also trying to. I, I could see a lot of. I could see people say, you know, if you want to create an anti-racist society, you need. This is the perfect opportunity to say, hey, well, hey, hey this thing that happens all the time, this isn't okay. We're going to stop. Well, this I think right like one on what when you're in the woods with a cop, like who's clearly demonstrated that they're kind of shitty. Well, like, it's just not the time. See, but I, this is this, this is, is interesting. To up to but they the also called the cops yeah. because the cop says, hey, next time the number to call is is I'm animal right, control, right. which indicates off screen they had a discussion about should we call the cops? Mm-hmm. And then even though she wouldn't have wanted to, she had to go, yeah, that's a normal thing to do. So yeah, let's call the yeah. cops. But then she had to get out of that situation. It's almost like there could be a deleted scene yeah, there. This, fair. But this, uh, so this is what complicates things. That this is one of the things that has been kind of called for, uh, for uh, white people have been called to use their privilege, right? To, to, uh, to help people of color and I think that that's what's that's what's happening here like she's identifying that what this cop is doing in this moment is a racist thing mm-hmm. you don't need to ask for the black guy's ID but you're doing it anyway just because you're profiling him and uh-huh. so I'm like uh, she's like I'm gonna stop this using my privilege because white you know that's another stereotype thing that happens pretty white women get off easier with cops mm-hmm. than other groups of people so she's like, okay, I am I have the advantage here, so I'm going to use my privilege. Silence is violence, da- David. Yeah. Silence is violence. I, I don't I know. Think I think the car, we, like you said, but, but like you said we, we don't have the experience, so we're like speaking kind of like we're extrapolating from like the little bits we know. So I'd be interested, people who have had, like people of color who have had that experience, like let us know in the comments. What's the right move here, guys? We yeah. don't know. Yeah. It just seems like the pragmatic <laughs> thing to do. And the, the you escalating. She's the, escalating it, though. She's escalating it for a person of color in a place where the cop has total control. I think, you know what she could have done, though? Like, obviously, she has her motives, but let's say that's removed from yep. the situation. He says, hey, it's cool. At that point, back off. Yeah, that's exactly. True. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Anyways. I think that in my, if I was, if I was Rose in that situation, I wouldn't confront him before he yeah. shows the ID. But if he like kept going on that line of questioning, I'd be like, okay, this is a bit yeah. ridiculous. If you're on the street and people were filming, hell yeah, you escalate the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but like in the backwoods. Let's get this top page, front yeah, page of Reddit. Exactly. Let's go. You know yeah. another thing they do before that to endear us to Rose? Because the deception is so deep in this movie. In yeah. the first scene with them together in their apartment, she's holding that dog. She's treating that dog good. She's petting the dog, loving the yeah. dog. And that is classic. That's classic Make- save the cat stuff. Like yep. you're going to, you're going to. If a character is nice to an animal, you like them. If they're bad to an animal, you don't like them. Mm. I want to go back to the uh, the hypnoti- hypnotizing scene there for it's a such second. Such an iconic because, scene. Because the sunken place it really is the moment for me that this movie elevates itself be, uh, above, you know, it was, it was going well up until that point, you know. <laughs> it was interesting, yeah. but I think that, like, you know, we've we, there's a lot of these sort of, like, single location horror things, and I feel like putting in this this sort of, like, more supernatural sci-fi element of uh, there's this there's this subconscious state that we can induce in you the sunken place and the visuals of him falling down so through cool. this like you know deep when pit. she uses the voice on him like Dune style <laughs> yeah. she's like sink, sink. yeah sink. yeah <laughs> no, no, honestly that, that that sentence there is so great he's like now sink into the floor he's like wait 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 she's like sink <laughs> And the like yeah. the, the music and the sounds come with it's it. It's super cool. It's like the first like surreal moment. Suddenly yeah. he's in space, yeah. falling. He's yeah. powerless. And the thing that's so dope about it is it is a visual that explains an entire concept to us. With yeah. that one yeah. visual, we we immediately understand and can relate to what would it be like to be a passenger in your own body where you can see what's going on, but it's at a distance and you're complete your autonomy is completely removed and stripped and you have no power in your own mind. They didn't have to say any of that shit. Yeah. They yeah. just show us this little TV screen far away. Totally. And yeah. the one in the close-up of his eyes totally still with the tears coming out. Yeah. It's powerful. Oh, man. And they do such a good job building up to it, too, because that the scene before is the first jump scare of the movie. It's uh, the the maid who's the grandma, like, scurrying. And it's like, you get... you. <laughs> it's the one... It's like the only musical sting in the movie. And then you get the grandpa running at him. And it's so interesting. Like, they're building this tension. And then they kind of relieve it. You get the scene. But then Catherine Keener goes, like, crazy analyzing him but like breaking his defenses down that's yeah. really cool that you mentioned that it makes me kind of realize that this the technique being deployed is to like let's get some background anxiety built up yeah. let's make your butthole clench a bit <laughs> so then when you see this thing that is not jump scary it's mostly dread 
He's like falling in right. silence in space. It's totally just dread, but it's terrifying in part because physiologically we're already uh, we are, we're already nervous. Yeah. Totally. I also love um, from a from a lore perspective, <laughs> lore guy. How consistent how consistent uh, the movie is with like explaining what's happening and the mechanisms of that. Like, yeah. okay, we're remo- we're gonna remove your brain first. We're gonna push your consciousness down into the like more reptile brain of like the brain stem and stuff. So it's like you're trapped down there and then we're going to remove the higher functions of the brain and put yeah. in a white brain. And so I think that the way that we see uh, the black people uh, act when they are kind of, when they do the, the camera flash and they're kind of woken up for a second, they don't act like fully functioning cognitive human beings. They kind of act like on instinct, right? Yeah. Like, uh, when it happens to Logan, all he can scream is get out. Yep. He doesn't say, help, I'm trapped in a body, like call the police, this yeah, is yeah. fucked up shit. He, you know? he only has like gross motor control. Yeah. He can like walk forward, yeah. put his arms He's out. just like, get out, get yeah. out, get out. That's all he can scream. It kind of reminds me of like when you're coming out of uh, being uh, put under. Right. And like you're like, you're you're, like your body, fugue. yeah, your body's conscious or awake, but your brain isn't. And it's yeah. like, you're, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's intense. There's a ton of like unconscious uh, processes that happen that yeah. we, you know, take for granted, but without which we wouldn't be able to function yeah. as a biological system. And I think that like seeing it kind of seeing the consistency, which with, with which they depicted it here is great. Like the grandpa, you know, he, when he wakes up from the flash, he just, he doesn't speak. He just grabs the gun and you think he's going to shoot Chris, but then he shoots and Rose so, instead. Oh, yeah. And then he looks at Chris. It doesn't say anything. Just shoots himself. God. Yeah. It's like Cause that he knows thing. he's been in that state. He's been in that sunken place for years yeah. yeah and he's like oh i got my chance now yeah. it's like he's already gone through mentally like what would i do if i got a second right yeah just end it yeah and i like the yeah that they set up the the flashes enough to break them out of it but it's not oh go ahead oh but but the, and i love that first scene the, especially the first time you watch it when andre lunges forward because you don't know that there's a person in there reaching out. you're just like something that there's like some level of like breaking we don't yeah, know what yeah. it is and like he freaks out and you're almost like did the flash make him angry right like, there's so much going on in your brain the first time the second time you're like, yeah, yeah I see what's yeah, happening. Yeah, but yeah. I, I remember the first time just being shook. I was like, what the fuck just happened? Right. And but Andre's reaction to the flash isn't the first time that uh, someone in the sunken place tries to kind of reach out. Mm. It happens just minutes earlier with Georgina. She's filling up the pitcher with juice or whatever it is, and it starts to overflow. Oh. And, and it's because it's being triggered by trauma. So what's being discussed at that part at that part is when did, did, did they're talk oh they're talking about the party is going to happen. They're saying, yeah, in a couple of days all our friends are going to be here. We're going to have this annual party. And that's mm. when she starts starts overflowing the picture and and I think oh. it's because the person in the sunken place is kind of trying to reach out because they've been triggered by the mention of this party because this party is the first event that kind of triggers me being a prisoner. Right. She knows retrospectively that party was when yeah. I got auctioned off. Right, right. So it's a right. traumatic event in, for her, and that's what makes her. That's interesting. I yeah. didn't, I didn't make that connection. Thanks, James. You're welcome. Um, it's sweet though because it's, it's not just exposition because they're sitting at the table talking about this is what's going to happen, everyone, and it's really just an info dump. Yeah. But it's not because you have this added thing with Georgina. Right. So it just makes it way better. This is a, uh, yet another one of the brilliant, um, I think, intentional. Uh, things in this movie where it's just like, oh, that's a reference to this. Like the camera flash representing uh, like cameras and film as a way to kind of like wake people up to the reality oh, like of media. what's going on and that we've kind of been brainwashed to think certain things and we have these uh, uh, you know unconscious uh, desires and maybe some racism going on there. Mm-hmm. So it's like... Okay, this is one of those things though. I, I, like, I like maybe it's intentional, I maybe like it's it, not. But I, I was I listened to Jordan Peele like talk quite a bit about this movie, and he mentioned a couple times that there's a lot of people in film classes and stuff that would say they give all these really articulate diatribes about <laughs> yeah. what they saw about systemic <laughs> yeah, racism in this definitely. movie, and then he would be like, "Yeah, yeah, I totally meant that. Yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, word. Yeah, that's what I was going for." Yeah. So there's a lot. Yeah, a you lot. never know. I mean, there's the English lit syndrome of just like, oh, and this is symbolism for blah blah. blah. And there's no movie. It's all valid. That lives up to all the fan. But theories. I'm pretty sure the camera thing is. I don't. I, don't know. I could see it. I could see it. I could see it. But I, like I doubt it. Easily. Yeah. It all fits. It all fits. It fits. Do you know why I think this movie is as big of a hit as it is? Why? It's got a happy ending. Yes. I think like it's so common now 
for horror movies to have that dark ending. Everyone dies. There Maybe is a dark ending they shot. Have you seen it? No. There's an, you can see it on YouTube. It's like, if you just type in alternate ending, uh, the, the cop car pulls up and just two white cops get out oh. with, with guns drawn. And yeah, then yeah. the next scene is him. I think he it shows him in prison. He like He's on the phone with Rod through oh, the glass. Wow. Yeah. But I think That's it. I think it would have been so much worse. If, People would have been that, pissed. Yeah. yeah, because I. Uh, when did Black Lives Matter start happening? This was in 2017. Mm-hmm. I think Black Lives Matter was sometime before that. Sure. And I think that in the context of this sort of like. Uh, broader awareness of systemic effects affecting uh, mm-hmm. you know black people and all this. Um, I think that there needed to be sort of a less a less cynical take. Where it's like it, it more more kind of like okay we're recognizing what's happening and this is bad and we all need to know about this and we need to like do stuff about it mm-hmm. but there needs to be that sort of hope at the end so that we don't just like I think it started you want to you want to make people want to build stuff yeah and fix stuff not burn things down yeah and it's uh it's just it would be such a bummer to end the movie on a on a note where the audience knows what happened but the main character that we like and are rooting for has like a misunderstanding totally ruin his life like that's not a f- cool ending that's yeah like, and it's not like it's end- a downer well, it's, it's a downer like and it's not, it doesn't ending. say anything it's, it's like yes that's what society it does but the move this ending still accomplishes that by having the lights suck go and you see him like fuck you're right it's yeah. over you yeah. get you, that you get that and, and then, then you get to go Woo! Yeah, exactly yeah, best of both worlds yeah. Hannah montana baby but there are so there's so many horror movies that end this way right there's so many horror movies that are just like, and it's a tragedy, and everyone dies, yeah. and it's like, oh, it's dark. Watch out for this monster. Yeah, well, because they, I feel like people think that's like the better ending. Like horror has to be dark. Yeah, it's like, no horror. It needs to be the point of the horror is not to scare you. In my opinion, it's to say something and disarm you in a way where you're ready to accept a harsher message. Yeah, I, I'm so irritated when people are like, oh, you just want a happy ending. It's like a lot of the time, a happy ending. Makes the movie better, yeah, because you enjoy it more. And yeah. it's like, okay, we do need to have a hard look at the realities of life, and that's important. But at the same time, what what's what are you trying to accomplish with the movie? Are yeah. you trying to make people leave the theater depressed yeah. and cynical and nihilist and be like, nothing matters? Let's just burn everything down. You want people to take away a message from your movie, and the message should be TSA rules. Everything sucks, but. We can do something about it. We can help. Yeah. You know, like at the end of the day, you you can find uh, camaraderie with people. You can find hope. Well, and even like we talked about how this movie is really good at reversing expectations. The expectation in a horror movie, the trope is black guy dies first. And right here, it's like nah, he makes it to the end and he kills all the white people. <laughs> yeah, because he he wanted to make a movie, a horror movie with the the guy, the person in the horror movie knows that th- there's horror. Yeah, and so. There's no uh, in his word in Peel's words. There's no like walking backwards into a dark stairwell. I'm like, no, don't go that way, bitch. Yeah, You're stupid. <laughs> well, I love that. Instead, he's like, no, I need to get out now. Yeah. Give me the keys. It's his own resourcefulness that ends up saving him. Like the fact that he uses the the cotton from the chair to plug his ears because he's, right. he's smart and he knows like, okay, it's the hearing that that paralyzes me. Does that? He picks he, cotton. He picks yeah, cotton, yeah, which is like which a, is a neat another thing. thing. See, but this is. A, that's definitely that's, definitely that's actually a thing okay peel says said that was um, intentional but then i love the escalation of the violence because like the first person he kills is the person we probably most actively hate which is jeremy yeah. I, jeremy's like that's the first person he, he strikes yeah and you're oh yeah you're right he doesn't kill him but you're like i th- i think a lot of audiences are probably repulsed by jeremy yeah uh and so you're like fuck yeah bitch is dead and he kills him with a bocce ball yeah he uses the, all these yeah. suburban weapons yeah but <laughs> yeah. then even like the way they bring the deer back he uses the deer which yes. is like the the trigger, like the the reminder of the deer, which is connected to his mom. I'm proactive now. I'm proactive. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that that works really well. And then he goes up, and then even even the way he does finally kill Jeremy, where he's trying to get the door, and Jeremy keeps closing it, and then he tricks him into opening it and kicking him, and then he stabs his leg. Yeah, You're like, yeah. dude's so smart. Dude's like really using a hundred percent of his. It brain. goes back to that whole jujitsu judo thing. Oh you know, yeah. Where, Jeremy's like, you got to be three steps ahead. Yeah. Hold on though, because I, I you've just triggered me into. Nitpicks. We're nitpicks already? <laughs> okay, I have a nitpick for that though. It's like oh, yeah. if he has this knife in his hand and he's able to swing it down at Jeremy's leg when he when he That's kicks fair. up, then why wasn't he able to just swing it down into his like body and ribs or anywhere while just standing there without what? Jeremy kicking? Nah. Well, was it a knife or was it something? It was, I, I thought think it was, it was scissors. It was like an improvised weapon, yeah. So it's like you're right, he probably could have done it, but 
Mais, no, it, this was better. Yeah, and like it's like you don't get as much force. Going I feel like the, I don't know. Man. I feel like I didn't think about that because the framing was so close. Mm. If if they had maybe it would bother me if uh, the framing was wider and I could see like the range of motion that he could just do to get his like hand back there. Yeah, but he was also kind of like behind him, so it's like maybe like you could try to do it. But that's then, true. If he if uh, Jeremy had Chris's left leg between Jeremy's legs. He's on that side of his body, right? So you can't swing that far. Uh, Here's James yeah. actually like doing jujitsu in real life and <laughs> thinking about the mechanics of this. That's what I would do. Yeah. That, yeah. No one else. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, maybe not. You can no get a takedown that way, also. Uh, totally. Uh, my nitpick, and it's the nitpick use of nitpicks, is the when they have the CRT that's playing the video explaining what the process. The CRT is. guy the here. CRT. It's just <laughs> when they have the CRT. It looks really. It looks really bad because it's like a flat image. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on a curved screen, so just like your brain is like, ah, that doesn't look right because like you know that it should be a curved glass, but it's just a screen replacement. But they just did. Oh, they corner. didn't. They didn't actually play that content on, a, yeah, on that CRT. screen because it's hard to shoot a crt it's that's reflective fine. uh but yeah oh, it, and it's it would flickery have, yeah it would have a look uh but it yeah my brain was like ah uh, that's that's not right oh interesting i, I feel like i that just that kind of sold it a bit more for me sure i feel like if it was because it's like you, you know that these old tvs have the domed screens or mm -hmm. whatever concave convex no, convex mm -hmm. um anyways that's fine that's my one epic hippic the fact that at the auction <laughs> They gave the yellow bingo card to the Asian guy. I was like, is that, that must be on purpose. I don't know. I was, like, did they? Yeah. Everyone else is. I mean, the they're colors. race essentialists. That's exactly. So maybe so. they were Why just are they like, all wearing red? Huh? Are they all wearing red? A lot of the guests are wearing huh. red, like red ties, red dresses. It might hmm. be a set deck thing in or like a prop production just, design thing, not necessarily yeah. a story Just thing. like an evocative. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like red as a color that makes you kind of be like, oh. No. Oh, there's some red. I like when uh, he's escaping and then he had to confront the mother and they see the, the tea oh, glass yeah. and spoon in between them and that's like, that's her weapon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they die for it. He just die, yeah, yeah, they die for he smashes it. It's so great. It's so, it feels so good when he actually smashes yeah. it because you're like, now you have nothing. Yeah. And it's great that it is made of glass because he mm. can just dive at it and push it. He doesn't have to well, grab it. China. He, he, well, okay. <gasps> what does this symbolism? Have to do with oh. he, like he just has to push it and it breaks. It's well, not like if it was wooden, then it's like he's got to throw it away. I, or, I mean, there might be symbolism in related to the teacup because I mean, tea. Oh, definitely. Like the, yeah. Br the English Pico tea that like that look is like such a British looking. Yeah, thing. I think the tea being like a a, a symbol of like sophistication and yeah. like upper class type stuff. Maybe, lots of cultures maybe have tea. a bit, but I think it's really just it's a mom mom tool that was. No, in, it's innocuous. Like she's. She has this tool with her that he doesn't know is a tool. She's yeah. just having tea. Oh, I think that's probably part of it as well. I but I think that like the the whole house and everything, and the fact that there are white people and black servants, kind of evokes this like sort of old deep South like plantation type of vibe. And so like people having tea in these like elaborate, uh, you know, China. I, I think that I think that it very clearly is like. Uh, I think that's supposed the, to be a symbol. I think of that's the ice, that's the icing on the cake. Yeah, know, I would say sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm upset. My, my big hit pick. Uh, once we know that Rose is evil, the way they go further in her characterization, and she's yeah! eating cereal by eating individual pieces, <laughs> half bite, doing the other bite, and then drinking milk from a cup. Like that's yeah. you know that's a fucking psycho. Okay, and then I she uses Bing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she it's uses, a Microsoft movie though. Yeah. Yeah. The oh, scariest okay. part of this whole movie is that Windows Phone. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay, wait. I remember hearing something about the Fruit Loops and how it was like that's how she actually w eats them or something. No, no, no. I saw her say that she doesn't do that in an interview. Does she not? I don't think. How so. did they? Not. But she came up with it. I don't know. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to just show her as a psycho. Oh, and, and people read into it because oh, it's like it white not mixing with color. The infamous Fruit Loop scene mm. wasn't in the original script. It was added while we were already on set in Alabama shooting. Williams said uh, they thought it up at the moment of shooting. Okay, so that's what yeah. it was. It's so good. Do you think there's... There probably wasn't a symbolic element if they were thinking of it. It's probably just like a really good little characterization. But could you pull like a a, like a, a metaphor out of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. The white and the color don't mix. Oh, yeah, yeah. That oh, sense. sure, I yeah. Say that. yeah. I also just love in that scene how when she goes to drink the milk, she takes like five separate sips. Yeah. She, just, she doesn't go like... Well, okay, maybe. She, she goes like sip. Do you see her sip. eat the second half of the, the Fruit Loop or does she only eat half of it? I think she only said half. half okay, so she wants half of the black people. She wants like the skills and the like the. the, the <laughs> oh, okay. But then she wants to occupy it mostly with All white. Right, I'm getting James uh, yeah, like now it. and saying yeah. that's not intentional. But here's a that, hit pick: when Chris goes upstairs and the rest of the party falls silent, oh, all their conversations oh, just end. Yeah, that's so, so eerie. Creepy. That was creepy because the whole thing is like, 
I'm an outsider and I feel really paranoid about it. And, and this is just true. like your worst your worst nightmare comes true. Like what yeah. if what if they really are thinking about you and, and looking at you and scrutinizing yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And he doesn't know that they're doing that. Yeah, it sounds um, so eerie. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say about the Rose thing as well that like when she first when she calls Rod on the phone and she's sitting there in her white turtleneck doing the like oh, yeah. expressionless voice oh, acting yeah. thing. Yeah. So good. So good. Because I think she's like, oh my God, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, no expression on her face. It's so good. Yeah, where, what? You, you, didn't, you don't know where he is? Yeah. Yeah, and that makes the movie, it's creepy to watch, but it also makes the movie more believable. It's like, we're, we're being shown how she could she could uh, pull this off. Again. Yeah. Pull yeah. this off again and again. It really just tells you, it, like, more than the Fruit Loop scene, that tells you that she's a psychopath. And she, like, she does not feel. I think you can't, I, I the one thing with this movie that probably keeps it at 9.3 is, like, you can't think about it too much that there's all these, like, people that have gone missing and they all went on a family trip. Like, I, I, to me, it's hard that they wouldn't ever connect it. Maybe that's part of the message that the police just don't care as much about black people going missing. Well, I they didn't so. all, because it says that Jeremy recruits his just by... Knocking oh, you the that's fair. So that's it's fair. like they're each There's of the kids has, has their own strategy. You know what? That's fair. Yeah. And I imagine that like they've only been dating for like four or five months. Yeah. And so maybe she hasn't like, you know, they haven't integrated friend groups probably very much mm. at that point. So like maybe not a lot. Yeah. Lot maybe of she know. specifically avoids that. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a good point. Uh, nitpick is that Rose doesn't like stop when he flashes the grandpa. <laughs> that's a funny sentence. Well, when I he, think she he, doesn't know. But she's seen it work before. Oh, she's that's seen it, true. She's seen it happen. And to me, it's like they've done the process enough that, like, I'm sure there's been situations where they recognize that the flash is enough to wake them up. It's fine because, like, the catharsis is so good in that scene that, like, I'm willing to forgive it. But I was like, I think she would know not to, like, go up and, like, not trust this. At least not trust this person. Yeah. Unless, like, mm. she was still kind of far back at that point and she didn't Maybe. see that he did the flash. It's like... Dead of night, though, so it's like hard to imagine that she didn't see yeah. anything. It's fine. Nitpick. Not a real problem. Plot hole or the whole yeah. thing. That's pretty strong Bad nitpick. Thing. Hit pick. When Georgina cries and smiles at that same time, <gasps> she's doing like, she's she's acting two characters. The actor is, is Betty Gabriel. She's acting two characters at the same time. There's the character in the sunken place trying to get out with the single tear, and then there's the character, the grandma, trying to suppress it and put on a happy <laughs> face. And it is... Two characters once. It's better than Gollum. Yeah. It, it's so awesome. It's she so deserves good. a shout out for that. Yeah, she, she is amazing. freaking killed it there. I, man, I thought I... Oh, man, I was confusing her with another actor that has been in, like, Star Trek and stuff. That's not, but yeah. she, she's she gotten work since they then. They don't all look alike, Riley. Jeez. Okay. And I love, I, I love <laughs> that they have a reason that makes sense to cover the scar on their forehead. Yeah. And then in the climax, you see that they both have scars. Right. Yeah, That's they're smart. all wearing hats and wigs. Yeah. Uh, here's a nitpick. CGI fire looked pretty bad. When is the CGI fire? Uh, the, I didn't notice the it. house. Yeah, it's um, the dad when he's dying, he like knocks over a candle oh, and lights yeah. a fire. Yeah, but um, it's a Blumhouse movie, so if you guys know don't know what that is, it's a studio that acts kind of like venture capital, where they're like, okay, we're gonna make a bunch of movies, and nine out of ten are gonna suck and lose us money, but one out of ten is gonna make us a lot well, of money. And this movie cost four point five million, and it made two hundred and fifty. Biggest opening million. horror weekend for a not sequel for an original wow. new franchise wow. I, I believe well deserved this is like as Crazy. this is exactly what i want a horror movie to be yeah absolutely so i didn't it, notice the fire was looked weird at all i mean i wasn't really looking it's, at it's it, in the corner of the screen but if yeah. you look at it it's it's not real fire and it looks bad and i've heard uh other blumhouse like they're really hard line on the amount of money you get and they won't yeah. give you more and they just say figure it out yeah do so it. i could see yeah uh, in post-production they just couldn't afford it <laughs> mm. I feel um, like video copilot that has to have a better fire tutorial <laughs> using After Effects. Uh, hit pick the grandpa black guy is so fucking creepy. Uh, when he Walter, saw, Walter, Mar yeah, Walter, uh, played by Marcus Henderson. He does such a good job of like, and uh, Georgina uh, Betty Gabriel does this as well, where they are like, like you were saying, they're playing two characters because it's not enough to have them play white people; they have to play like old white people uh, yeah, old who are trapped in a body and don't really know how to do things properly. You and know? they have to use old timey language and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh yeah, uh, Rose, eh? one of a kind, top of the line, a real doggone keeper. Doggone? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. yeah, I do like that. <laughs> and just like the way he smiles and his like eye contact, it's just, he, he kills it there. My, so My question is, do they have them doing the help stuff just to keep up appearances to like make 
Chris not yeah, worry. Yeah, I think so. But yeah. I feel like yeah. Okay. Yeah. They can't just be hanging out there. Like, yeah, these are our buddies. Yeah. It would just be weird. Yeah. Although I guess they end up because Georgina is serving drinks and stuff during the party, but Chris is there, so yeah. it's like yeah, old people know. love that shit anyway. They love raking leaves and <laughs> serving tea. Um, this That's is like hilarious. sort of a hit pick, I guess. Allison Williams. Uh, th- this is like a number of things like this happen in the movie, but her embarrassment at her family throughout the encounter at the house is it plays so well uh, when from both perspectives, both for the first watch and sub- subsequent watches. It's like she is f- truly embarrassed because if it's her first black boyfriend, it makes sense yeah. because, oh, he, they haven't been like this with anybody else. Yeah. I don't know why they're acting like this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it makes a ton of sense. But on the second watch, you're like, she is trying to cover for the fact like she's still trying to play her character, yep. and so she's like trying to still make him at ease, even though these unsettling things have happened, and she knows that she's a, he's being unsettled. Yeah. So she's like overplaying this character. The movie does such a good job of not letting you know what side she's on until the very last moment. Like yeah, I don't they really draw time. it out even more. Even when you know that she's gonna turn, she's she's like I'm looking, I'm looking. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, like yeah. she didn't have to do that. Yeah, yeah and then when like their excuse for going, and they're like, he's like, yeah, we're leaving actually, and and. Uh, I think the dad or the mom is like Rose and she's like yeah his his dog got sick and she like comes up with an excuse that, like she doesn't have to at that yeah. point the jig is up they and just then, extend the the tension and she scene. leans over him when he's in the sunken place she's like you are one of my favorites yeah <laughs> like such a good <laughs> well you still have pictures of those other guys he's way better looking oh for sure there's some pretty good looking Daniel Kaluuya not all of them Daniel Kaluuya, Kaluuya rules a, his accent catch. was a bit shaky once or twice accent oh because he's yeah. British right yeah, no, yeah yeah oh his accent there was two times where I was like oh I heard Heard his natural yeah, there's a little bit there. there, but I feel like it kind of works because it's like uh, unsettling. I, I don't know. He he also is playing this sort of like terminally chill person. Yeah, yeah but yeah, like yeah. you said, he's he's not very proactive. He's he's trying his best in every situation just to kind of like smooth everything over. Hey, it's fine. Don't worry about. You want to talk about accents though? His biggest nitpick the of the movie is the brother. Why does the brother sound completely different than that the rest of the family? That guy is so overacting, trying to be yeah. Heath Ledger's Joker. Like, yeah. Ah, uh, he's the weakest part of the movie, That's I would fair. say. He's he succeeds at being creepy and hateable and for sure. Him. And and I like the dynamic of he, he, like the rest of the family's like, dude, chill, you're gonna you're ruining it. You're gonna give up the whole act here. We're yeah. Gonna, some subtlety. And it's also kind of like a dude, hands off the merchandise. We're gonna sell this guy tomorrow and you're gonna yeah. bruise his neck. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. there's lots of cool stuff going on. But uh, why the hell does he talk like that? That's fair. <laughs> exactly. You could be a fucking beast. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up talking like this. <laughs> my other nitpick is... Fell my head my, as a kid. My final nitpick is the... Uh, I don't like the flashbacks when it's all being revealed at the end when Chris is tied to the chair and he's learning what the whole coagula thing is. Yeah. And there's flashbacks to the party and stuff. Yeah. Like just literal flashbacks of scenes we've seen. Yeah. You know, well, sometimes it's fashionable to be black and then it, it shows like that guy, he repeats his oh, line. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, I, we remember. Yeah. I didn't need that. But maybe it's because yeah. I've seen the movie twice. I don't know. It just seemed a little cheesy and I, I would, that's the one thing I would change in this movie. I'd get rid of that. Right. Yeah. But related to that, I was going to say hit picks are all the little, all those little scenes yeah, at the party really where the people are. I love are just, Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I do know Tiger. Yeah. I love Tiger. Yeah. And then the woman asking him, like, so is it true? Is it different? Oh, my God. And, yeah. like, and you know, the guy, we said it before we started recording, but, like, fair skin has been in favor for the past couple hundred years, but now the pendulum has swung back. Black is in fashion. Yeah. As if black is just, like, cl- clothes you, you can wear. wear. Yeah. And then he's like, I'm going to go take a couple pictures. Yeah. One, uh, <laughs> one of the so things good. I think that's really cool in this movie is I've heard Jordan Peele talk about Daniel Kaluuya saying that he's, like, He's got these eyes that just like put you inside of his mind and like you just like he is your eyes into yeah. the movie. But it also works on another level because in the movie his eyes are being coveted by, mm-hmm. right. by a white guy who's blind which is nice. But then it's like there's an element of like as a viewer you're like I'm occupying his eyes and obviously it's not quite the same dynamic but I thought that was cool that there's like this meta element of yeah. us trying to occupy his eyes. Right. Like no, it. Us is the next movie. Uh, yeah. This is the next movie. Not as also, good. Also, um, that's true. It's I, good. Yeah, not as good. I like what they did with with um, Jim Hudson, who's the art dealer guy. Stephen yeah. Root. Uh, Isn't he? What else has that guy been? In? Guy He's the stapler in. guy. What's his name though? S- Stephen Root. No, what's the guy? Who, like, I just want my stapler. Oh, like, Isn't that the same guy? Who, space. Doesn't he do um, in King of the Hill? He's uh, Bill. Bill. Yeah. 
That guy rules. He's yeah, awesome. he's been in a ton of stuff. Um, but I love what they do with him because he's not like, I'm gonna get your eyes. Yeah, he's like, ooh, I uh, black people. I want he's to. Kind of, for him, it's like he's an unfortunate transaction. Well, and even the fact that he's a he's commodified art, and so he's clearly objectifying this man. And he's gonna commodify him. But in his head, he's like, we're together. We're gonna do so much yeah. better. And he's he doesn't see it as like stealing from him. He's like, oh, to, like we're cooperating but it's like no you're fucking stealing everything that he is it makes the villains in this movie so much more compelling because they're not like scheming evil masterminds that you know i want to control the world they're like we get it man like we we totally get your struggle and so you know we're gonna help you by combining our bodies (laughs) and so it's just like it's this sinister well-meaning uh sentiment that that elevates that character while at the same time not really like allowing us to fully like empathize with them but it's so thin it's such a thin argument you can tell it's just like a mental justification 100%. yes for 100%. evil right and that's it's why a- it's still unsettling because you're like okay at least you're not the s- super villain but at the same time it that's almost worse mm-hmm. you know that that you that this doesn't even make fucking sense yeah. like think about it for one yeah. more second and I, that's why i think the brother's a bit over the top, but I like his presence because he is the presence of like more overt aggressive racism. Right, right. And it'll work for me. Uh, oh, fuck, I had something. That's uh, all I have for this, guys. My my last hit pick is the pound handshake mix-up. <laughs> oh, yeah, the trailer hitch? He's like, hey, man, nice to see another brother here, whatever they have their the little interaction. The fist just comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, and I love how that's the cap on the conversation. He's just yeah. like, oh, okay, I must go, you know, blah, blah, blah. All right, see you later. And then we just see uh, Chris's face, and he's just like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I had hit pick when uh, Rose smiles when he's choking her. Oh, yeah. that was awesome. Such a good yeah. smile. And it really looks like it's realistic. Like you could tell she had some pressure on her neck to be able to pull that face off. Right. Which is interesting. So like she, I guess she dies anyways. She dies at the end, right? Um, but then he's, he's like killing her and it's almost like, he's like, Oh, I'm going to finally get my revenge. And then at the last second he stops because he's like, why does he stop? Does he stop? Because he's like, how are you this fucked up? <laughs> does he stop because he doesn't have to kill her? Because for everyone else he, he killed, knows- he was escaping. To yeah, get out, yeah. right? But this, he's not a murderer. Right. So if yeah. he can leave her alive, then. He and I will. think choking is so intensely personal. Like, that's his girlfriend. So there's it still is. these weird, conflicted But there feelings. was a moment where I was like, you know, you'd be justified in killing her right now because it's like she did, she almost killed you. These people have obviously done this to a lot of other people. They're a great evil. You'd be morally in the world. justified. They're a great evil in the world. And, you know, you're in a sort of combat situation already. You I can think, do that. I she had the gun. I don't know. He might have, like, finished the job after, but then the. The cop lights happen pretty quickly. Audiences after. might have been pissed. Yeah, I don't think he also. would have finished. I think that he stopped because he's like killing her and in the in the midst of this like revenge rage, and then she starts smiling. And I think he's just like, I think it just like takes he's just taken aback by like how fucked up she is. Yeah, he's just like, who the fuck are you? Like you, we were a thing. You dated all these guys. We were together for five months. Like I so thought that up. you were a real person, but you're like a evil machine it's uh it was I, it was such a great moment yeah in real life i would say obviously don't murder someone like that but in the in the context of the movie i would be like he'd be totally justified i'd be like that would be fine that's pretty fist pumpy when he kills everybody <laughs> in real life though we're talking about i'm just, I'm just saying in i mean real life this is a weird sci-fi horror movie where they can transplant brains and they're stealing the bodies yes yeah, that's what i'm saying in the movie it makes sense yeah um it's time for us to move on to another segment of the show riley which one Fan service. Mm, ba-da, ba-da. Um, that little tune gets oh, in my Oh, fan head. service. I thought that was now playing. No, man. Now playing sounds like this. What are we doing? I didn't we're going to do both, uh, but we're starting with fan service. Uh, so I wanted to bring up in, what was it? Thor, Thor Love and Thunder. So there are a bunch of comments. That's the last episode. I wasn't there. I know, you we weren't there. I haven't seen we it. Are you going to spoil James. it for me? What? Uh, I don't think I, I, we won't spoil it. Okay. Uh, but I think we were just, uh, I was surprised by the number of people in the comments. I guess I wasn't surprised. I was saddened (laughs) by the number of people in the comments who were like, oh, you guys didn't like this movie. That's so weird. I had a great time. Eight out of 10. Uh, I, should I bring up specific people? I don't know. (laughs) Um, but there are a bunch of comments on the Thor and Love and Thunder, uh, Thor Love and Thunder uh, episode talking about that, and I think I was just like, 
how is this the case? We were talking about this before, and I remember that we I wanted to bring this up for a reason. I forget what the reason People was. People are telling you to turn your brain off. Oh right, there was some discourse about uh, turning your brain off and how like you you know you shouldn't think too hard about these kind of like blockbuster action movies. But that's what you guys told me to do during RRR. But it's a different no, thing. No, that's like, a different thing. That's the, way the different. The Thor <laughs> is that there's not enough like thought put into the arcs or the emotional side of it. So the right. jokes are funny. Like there is some pretty funny jokes, but there's no sentiment of like, wow, we're overcoming. Oh, wow, the stakes are high. Oh, this. It's just like this happens and this happens and this yeah. happens. And you're like, oh, there's some cool stuff in the middle. I think that a lot of no people. In, I just didn't feel engaged anyway. Sorry. I think, I think that a lot of people have have taken to viewing Marvel movies as sort of like dumb action movies. Like you just go there to have some fun and it's whatever. But I think that like after the achievements of phase three, where we had these like good character arcs and building up to a good story with like a really compelling villain and a great conclusion Mm -hmm. to the, to the, to the, to the saga. Uh, Now to see Marvel movies come out that are like just dropping the ball in this way is just sad. And yeah, I think that I agree. the reason why I'm like, you shouldn't shut your brain off for this movie and other Marvel movies is because of the precedent set. Not because, you know, there shouldn't be any movies where you just go and don't really think too hard about it. There's movies where you shut time. your brain off. Yeah. yeah. But these are supposed to be like, like the mythos of our time. Yes. Yeah, so right? This is modern mythology. It's, it's replacing the, it's, the gap of that Star Wars left. It's $300 million to make this damn thing. They employ the most talented people on the planet. Why shouldn't we have high standards? Exactly. Exactly. Especially after Ragnarok, we already talked about this. Yeah. In the, but but I just mean, um, you know, if you want to shut your brain off and enjoy a movie, that's Go great. See RRR. Yeah, no, that RRR <laughs> is also something to it. R, R, I guess RRR is a little bit more on the shut your brain off side. But I think the reason why you didn't enjoy it is because you weren't open to experiencing this this different because completely you you likened it to Hot tasting sauce food. Yeah, food that just wasn't your taste. Yeah. Like the food is good, it just wasn't your taste. Yeah. Um, Whereas, like, you're going to, for this movie, it's like we're going to the best burger bar in town. Actually, you guys, it's a and, Wolfgang Puck, and then they serve you, uh, and then it's just thing. a shitty burger, and, and then people are like, "It's just a burger, man." And yeah, it's just yeah. Come on, burgers yeah, aren't supposed to be good. That's a perfect analogy. Yeah. Nice. Agreed. I also want to note that uh, multiple people in the comments, including Joel, oh Joel, uh, pointed out that uh, we thought that in Thor: Love and Thunder, that was the first depiction of a official afterlife in 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 the mcu but apparently it was spoilers for marvel stuff apparently it was also shown in moon knight uh oh i didn't i didn't, I didn't got finish, that far i didn't finish I moon knight but apparently there's minutes. an afterlife there and then there's black panther where they go to like the land of reeds i guess but i always thought that was maybe just like a drug trip yeah so i don't know wow no I, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> There's too much Marvel stuff. Do you have any fan service comments? Not fan service. No. All right, let's move into now playing. I'm not going to play the song again. No, no, that's fan service. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, I finished Marvel, Miss Marvel. I thought I had finished. I thought that was the end last How was that? Was that good? Oh, you did watch it. was it. okay. It was better than Moon Knight. I actually wanted to watch right. it to the end. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think like watch one episode. If you like the first episode, it's as good as it ever gets. Um, right. And like the kind of bigger, wider plot is sort of messy and like there's lots of characters and a lot of them you're just like, okay. Mm. But I think it does a lot of good stuff. The family core is good. Uh, All the Pakistani stuff. And like I saw a great tweet where it was talking about like the like I how why did was it a Marvel show that taught me about the partition and like the effects of that? Like this historical event that happened in India and Pakistan. Like Why don't they teach? teach that to us sure and i was like oh yeah like i actually learned something about a uh, historical event oh nice the show so that's all the strengths of the show not highly recommend but recommend one episode and then you'll know right i is it enough to is it is it good enough for me to like watch it again or because i'm on this thing where i'm like sort of boycotting not really obviously it's not <laughs> doing anything i just mean that like i don't want to spend time watching disney movie disney plus shows yeah if they're not going to be something where i'm like that's a good well, show. What it should have been is instead of four or six one hour episodes, it should have been one two and a half hour movie. It's like mm. there's so much. That's of this kind of the case with shit. every Marvel show. And that's though. the problem. I hate this six episode <laughs> format where they only have a movie's worth of plot to tell. Yeah. And then there's all this extra characterization and like all these extra characters that don't fucking matter and you know will not be part of the MCU. Was the was the is it clear that what they did was just like they had these concepts for movies? 
And then they were like, oh, we're going full on on this Disney Plus thing. We got to make them into TV shows. I bet I don't think even like, like that. I bet they just were like, OK, MCU is huge. How do we like blow it up and make as many properties as we can? We have Disney Plus. We have we need to make TV but shows. Why wouldn't they make just like even standard level standard length seasons and epi- some of their episodes even are like surprisingly short yeah sometimes they'll start with like an hour-long episode and you're like oh this is a tv well, show and then subsequent episodes are like 40 minutes plus credits my for 20 minutes my feeling is that they're looking at their disney plus catalog and they're like we don't have enough depth and so we need to give these weekly releases and they want to have like every week there's a disney plus show you want to watch so that you keep stay subscribed because they don't want people to get a month, binge everything, and then go. You ha- To be up to date on all the Marvel stuff, you have to subscribe to Disney yeah. Plus constantly. I think one of the most frustrating things for me about these Disney shows is the fact that, like, how, how did you feel about the budget? From from the trailers and stuff, clips that I've seen of Miss Marvel, it seems yeah. like the budget is a bit better for this than in other shows. Is that true? Um, It seemed, like, the graphics were pretty good. Uh, There's obviously weak moments because it's a TV show and it's just, they don't have the money and the time to make it all pretty good. I never found it distracting, but I definitely noticed it was a TV show. It just, it really seems, particularly with the Star Wars shows, it just really seems like they are cheaping out. And it's freaking Disney. Yeah. It's Disney. If you want, like, put the budget in. Put in the time. Don't rush these things out. Obi-Wan they're spending Kenobi. a lot. They're spending a lot. And it's not I'm the, sure they're spending a lot. It's but not the effects that need to get better for this crap. It's, yeah, it's, it's other story. story elements and characterization. Well, I, I think that's part of it. Like, go through more script review, uh, you know, rounds or something. It's no, like, probably get, less, actually. Get other probably people. fewer <laughs> reviews from less fewer people. people. Involved. Get yeah. someone other than Deborah Chow to direct a couple of the Obi-Wan Kenobi episodes. <laughs> I'm just still mad about that. <laughs> well, yeah, not not that specifically, but about the show in general, just kind of being. The problem is people like me who still watch a lot of it because like they need like Obi Wan was the biggest Disney Plus show ever. Yeah, and it's like it's not that doesn't mean we like it. Yeah, it was a five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like we are participating and we're watching it, and so they're like, well, why would we put more effort into changing it or like evolving it when the shitty just regurgitated stories are making the ultimate top views? So yeah, all right, now uh, playing. Uh, uh, I finished Arcane finally. Oh, nice! Did you guys watch Arcane? Yeah, I watched the first three or four episodes. It's good. You didn't finish it? No, I, I got to the time jump. It's it it was pretty interesting. I could have perhaps finished it, but I just never did. I feel like it's a little overrated. I mean, like I came to it late. I feel like I liked it, and there's really cool moments. I like the characters a lot. I like the art style. Yeah, the art style is really good, and it's like one of the first 3D kind of animated styles that I'm like, I, I really enjoy. Yeah, the, the anime, uh, the animation is obviously one of the like key things that yeah. sets it apart. It's so good. Some of the action's really good, like when Violet gets her fists and stuff, yeah. like even her final fist. Uh, and there's like there's lots of good stuff that's going on, and it kind of coalesces into the final a little bit. Uh, I really enjoyed it, but I, I didn't like cheer, and I wasn't like I didn't feel super deeply emotionally invested. I was right. like, this is neat, this is cool, and like, yeah, I get what they're doing. I would give it like a seven and a half. Like. I found that it ha- sort of had a Stranger Things thing where episode three, like up until episode three, four uh, did make me feel like the mm. time jump. The the I think the first three episodes and then there's a time jump. Is yeah. that oh, yeah. 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 So like at the end of episode three, I found myself feeling. Oh, where Jinx is like left. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And I was like, I, I. I'm feeling things uh, watching this uh, yeah, League of Legends show. I did not expect, good. and like the way, yeah, the way that they uh, they kind of like manipulated everything was just so great. And uh, and then after that, I think I agree with you. It just kind of like it's good. It's, it's good. good. I think people, if you are thinking about watching it, you should definitely watch it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, we'll see where season two goes. Yeah, just how a big of a phenomenon it was. It kind of surprised me. It was me. pretty big. I feel I like it was the just League of Legends side of it probably pushed it over the edge, but it was a good animated show with a cool art I style. think that was really the notable thing about it, was that it's a video game show, which usually suck. The shows have been good, though. What? Castlevania. The Castlevania's uh, good. The, uh, the Dota show is pretty good. Oh, is it? Yeah, apparently the new Resident Evil show is the best Resident Evil... Content. Content. These are all Netflix. That's a pretty fucking low bar. <laughs> okay, so Netflix has been uh, you know building a pretty good track record of video game adaptation, animated video game adaptations. Yeah. Uh, Wait, the Resident Evil show? Apparently the new one's pretty decent. I've heard that it's also it, garbage. I've heard <laughs> that uh, it's... But that might be just like angry fans. Yeah, I think it's one of those like, it's basically not Resident Evil. And so uh, all the fans are like, fuck this! Oh, okay, but, it's got like Star Wars syndrome. Yeah, I watched something, guys. I did it. What did you watch? I watched the first episode of the new Nathan Fielder show. Oh! The rehearsal. How was it? Have you, do you like Nathan Fielder? Not particularly. Did you watch Nathan for you? No. 
That show, have you heard of that ever? I've heard of it. That show is amazing. That's have, what I hear. Have you heard of that? No, I've been, uh-huh. literally everyone tells me to watch it. It's so funny. <laughs> and I think so I funny. maybe would enjoy it, but. Oh, it's amazing. Nathan, for you, just Google it. Yep. Hilarious. Dumb Starbucks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so <dumb> awesome. <laughs> and he has, the, he has a new show and it's called The Rehearsal and the first episode's out and uh, it's an HBO show. Is it sort of the same thing, like tricking people into thinking things and then, oh, actually, it's okay at the end? And- sort of. And this one is basically like, awkward person has a problem. I'm going to help you solve your problem. Oh, God. Uh, and it's, it's, he's, it's just masterful. Like, I don't want to spoil anything. There's okay. just so many things you're like, no. Oh, my God, they did that. They went to these lengths. Wow. <laughs> and then... But the, the the thing that's beautiful about it is not only the awkward, dry comedy, like tons of laugh out loud moments, but also he like he hits the right grace notes. There's the right like heartstrings and uh, culminations where I you're like that. you feel good. It, okay, it's that's awesome. Good. You guys should I, watch it. I feel like one of the things that um, from what I read and clips that I saw of Nathan for you and stuff, I, I one of the things that maybe bothered me was the fact that he seemingly kind of made these people look like fools. Uh, that's kind of like a core aspect of the show is like mocking people who are sincerely trying to do something. And so if there is sort of like a ending in this show where it's like a bit more like, oh, and it's okay at the end, then uh, that would make me more inclined to see it. I think he's more self-deprecating than making other people look like fools most of the time. There mm-hmm. is one episode uh, of Nathan for you where there's like a haunted house realtor or something like that. And it's like that person's like a crook. Right. Um, mm. Or like or there's like a medium or, or something like yeah, that or a yeah, fortune yeah. teller. So, but so what's the name of the show again? The re- the, the rehearsal. rehearsal. The okay. rehearsal. I will check it out. You should check it out. Will do. Okay. I mean, uh I don't really have a now playing that I'm like super stoked on, but I heard people talking about only murders in the building. Oh, I'm watching that. But Are I'm, you? Not, I'm not up to date, but oh, I'm okay. on almost on season 1. I think like I when it first came on to Disney Plus, I think it's a star uh, thing um, I was like okay that seems kind of interesting and I watched a bit of the first episode but then we got distracted and I never came back to it but then it got renewed for season 2 which is out and now it's got renewed for season 3 hey! and I heard people talking about how they really like the show and it's like a hidden gem and I'm like okay so I, I think we're on t- uh, episode 5 or I'm 6 now I'm about the same spot as you though. yeah and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it yeah it's pretty it's good not like a mind blowing show yeah, but it's but fun like, it's just fun seeing Steve Martin and Martin Short uh, play off each other yeah and Selena Gomez is great with she them. She is surprisingly, the chemistry yeah. is surprisingly good. Well, I never watched the show, like, Witches of Waverly Place. Like, that was just after I had grown out of, like, Disney oh, Channel yeah. stuff. I saw some of that. But uh, she, the the whole, they have such fantastic chemistry. And, like, I just like them all so much. And I'm cheering for them. Yeah. And I think it's a good, I, I don't like true crime. I think that it's weird and exploitive. And it's kind of fucked up. Like, yeah. if people are into true crime, it's a red flag to me. Right. <laughs> I mean, but so, fake crime. So but fake true every, crime. Every adult female white woman. It, it not just white. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't know. I just there's think that yeah, there's a, there's something. I get it. Like I love. Okay, full disclosure. I think true crime is very fascinating, and I've listened to true crime podcasts. I've watched like videos and stuff because like it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. But I also think there's like a really dark, fucked up side to you it. Think it's you, kind of repugnant. Yeah, and you you identify with the killers, or you admire you admire the killers, and you're like, wow, they got away with it for so long. They killed thirty people before they got caught. Oh, yeah. Wow, how did they get away with it? I, I could get away I, with I, it. I think you're just a sicko. It's true. Honestly, when I listen <laughs> no, to no, too no, much true crime, I, I start to be like, I think I'm a sociopath. The worst in you. This is this no, this is a phenomenon really? where, where women in particular get obsessed with serial killers and they like send them like uh, fan mail to like prisons and stuff. Oh, yeah, like that's real. They they get obsessed. And I don't under, I'm not trying to like completely stereotype all women obviously this is like a it's a it's a trope that's happening in okay. a certain segment of the population and uh yeah it's very confusing to me yeah i i what's, don't get it what's i mean the guy from mindhunter the ed kemper that's yeah. like the big guy yeah i saw like a tweet being like wow i, I don't know what it is but i just have always thought ed kemper was so hot i and know I was like, I just like, ah! what do you mean <laughs> yeah. um yeah i the ne- to be fair, Netflix has made some pretty good, uh, you know, crime documentaries. Yeah. Um, but it's really just, yeah, it's exploded. It's like an industry where they are just looking for all these like tiny little things now to like make podcasts about. Yeah. But I think that they, the the characterization of the characters in this is good. How they're like obsessed with true crime, and then, yeah. and I feel like Ed Kemper's pretty not hot. No. Well, especially in <laughs> the show. He's kind of chinless. In the too. show, he's like a... But he's like 6'7". Like, he's better looking in the show. Sorry uh, to derail you. Um, 
Uh, and the, I think that they're, the show is kind of mocking them a little bit, and yeah. I think it's going to show that, you know, obsession with this stuff uh, can not be good. Yeah, well, and I think the show does a good job showing, like, true crime is really true to people that have been better part of the true part of it. Right. So, it's... Uh, Wait, what? True? Like, true, the people like, who so were... Like, to us, true crime is, like, some story of, like... Yeah, yeah, It's almost yeah. like fiction, but kind of fucked up, right. but to someone, it was very true. Yeah, it's like people who are obsessed with true crime are just kind of, like, thinking of it as fiction. Yeah. But then if you, I feel like, I feel like that's what it is. It's like they're, they're focusing on the fictional aspect. They're, they're focusing on the like gruesome aspects and they're so removed from it. But if they saw the body in front of them or the family it, grieving, it, yeah, cool. they wouldn't yeah. be like, Ooh, no, guys, we gotta wrap this up. Yeah. yeah. Do we? I gotta go. You guys yeah. can talk without me. I'm, no, 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 we no, should no. go. It's over. Okay. Well, well see you I, later. You can tweet us. at us at TGM pod. You can email us. Uh, hello at they're just movies .com. There's a lot of emails in there. I got to get back to you guys. And I have to get back to you guys. James, we're glad you're back. Well, I'm glad you're back. Oh, uh, I can't speak for Riley. Thanks, yeah. James. You're the, you're the, have on. the tripod. Although, we while he was, we noted that while he was gone, you and I were more in sync. It's true. We had almost the exact same score. We had every like week. the same rating weird. for, all, yeah. Cool. yeah we, so. we decided that's because I'm always trying to impress you. So I have to like <laughs> change my score. Oh, so. interesting. Yeah. But I'm impressed by you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Not you, though, Riley. Aw. I could give a shit. <laughs> 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 but I love you. See you later. Bye.